any excellent firm has to have dreams. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears. I am your host, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. If you haven't already gotten access to our special free on-demand video course, head on over to smartpracticemethod.com to discover the four pillars that you must know about if you're running an architectural practice. Again, that's smartpracticemethod.com. Today you'll hear a presentation that recently was given by Patrick McLeamy for the Business of Architecture audience. Patrick McLeamy is the former CEO of HOK. During his 50-year tenure at HOK, McLeamy witnessed the firm's growth from a single Midwestern office in St. Louis to 27 locations across the globe offering architecture, interior engineering, planning, and more. What an incredible wealth and breadth of experience. As you can imagine, McLeamy's been through many recessions, and so that is the topic that you'll be discovering on today's episode. Today, he's going to give four pillars of what firms should do to be able to prepare for a pending recession. McLeamy joined HOK in St. Louis in 1967, after which he helped establish the firm's San Francisco outpost in 1970, later becoming managing principal of that office. He joined HOK's executive committee in 1995 and was named the chief operating officer five years later. In 2003, HOK stakeholders elected McLeamy the chief executive officer. He led the firm for 13 years. In 2016, McLeamy chose a new CEO for HOK, remaining as chairman for one more year before retiring, or as he likes to say, repurposing. Patrick McLeamy is also the chairman of Building Smart International, which works to achieve open standards for the exchange of digital information in the building and infrastructure industries. He's passionate about that area as well, and he was a founding member of Building Smart in 1994. We know that recessions are always at the tip of our minds, always there in the recesses of our minds. There's always a bit of, if you've been through recessions in the past, you know there's a bit of PTSD about having to go through another recession. We're all still suffering the trauma from the recession back in 2008, 2009, 2000, all the way to 2012, which actually was the reason why Business of Architecture got started. So we can see here that even in things such as recessions, there are always gifts to be had. So consider that a recession may not be the terrible doom and gloom you think, it may be the best opportunity that comes your way. And to help us be prepared for that opportunity, here is a presentation with Patrick McLeamy, former CEO of HOK and current chairman of Building Smart International. Enoch, thank you for having me on your program today. Uh, I have a passion for helping people uh, learn how to practice architecture, not just be architects. That's uh, that's that's uh, was founded many years ago in, in me when I had a uh, an architect, uh, as a young man, trying to learn, I had an architect turn me down. I just wanted to visit his office. It really stung me. So I resolved anytime I had the chance to help someone learn about how to practice, what the practice is like, my door is open. Uh, that's a little picture of me as a young architect in our first San Francisco office when super graphics were, were the thing. And uh, what you'll learn today are things that uh, they didn't teach you in school. Here's the outline. First is things to avoid. Second is designing your firm. And you know, you know how to design buildings, but you need to design your firm with the same intensity. You need to support great design. If you're not doing great work, uh, you're not actually going to be long-term successful. And finally, you have to have in your firm a strategy for excellence. So we'll go through each one of these four things in this little presentation. First, things to avoid. The first thing to avoid is no strategy. And too many architects jump into business without a strategy. What would I do if I inherited a million dollars? I'd probably practice architecture until it was gone. That's a cartoon out of the New Yorker magazine from many years ago. Or how about hope as a strategy? where you hang out your shingle and you hope that somebody notices, somebody calls you or somebody goes online and finds you and you're just waiting. And then I've seen this also partnerships of convenience where two people get together because, hey, we can share some cost and it'll be good for both of us, but they don't actually have a strategy for who will lead the 
the firm in what ways uh, as a partnership. So there's a constant clash between the partners. That's also a formula for failure, not success. Designing your firm. I was privileged and I was lucky to go to work for HOK, which was designed by the founder, George Helmuth. And he was the son of uh, an architect in St. Louis, Missouri in the early 1900s. His father and his uncle, Helmuth and Helmuth, what else? Practiced architecture at the turn of the century, back when St. Louis was actually the fourth largest city in the US. And he watched his father and his uncle struggle with their practice. Uh, they had clashes that each one said, if I bring in the work, I get to design it. Uh, neither one of them tended to the business side of the practice. And when they got a project, they would hire people to help them complete the work. They were called draftsmen in those days. And when the work was finished, if they had no new work, they would let the draftsmen go. And Helmuth grew up, George Helmuth grew up seeing this roller coaster ride of his father and his uncle's firm. Sometimes the family had money, sometimes it was belt tightening time. And uh, Helmuth was seared and determined to find his own way to make a firm that was sustainable. And he developed four principles in his own practice uh, that he thought were the most important. The first one is about talented people. Talented people are the key to a firm's success. And if you can attract and then keep people, not lay them off when the work is finished, nurture their talents so they get better and give them a place to grow up inside your firm, including becoming your partner. Uh, some, will, some will leave, but some will stay. And as they get better and better, you can pick the ones that are the best to become your future partners. So that's, that's the first principle. The second one is in order to keep those people full-time, talented people need steady work and steady work requires full-time marketing. And Helmuth is probably, we don't know for sure, but probably the first founder or principal of a firm who actually went into the business of full-time marketing himself. He said, I'm gonna get partners to design the work and to produce the work and to run the business. I'm going to focus my attention on marketing, bringing in the work. And I'm going to have that marketing supported by a full-time public relations program. In those days, it was getting published in the architecture magazines or getting uh, articles maybe in the local press. In these days, it would be building an online presence through, through social media and website, et cetera. And uh, he, he, his principle was to market clients instead of projects. Look for the clients that have the most value for your firm, the ones with repeat work, and stay focused and stick with them like glue. Whatever they need, you, you need to provide. Principle three is really, really important. Diversify your practice. How? Well, first, by building type. Helmuth grew up uh, and started his practice, which became HOK, in an era after the World War II when all the architects were quite busy designing schools because there was a baby boom after the war. And he could foresee the end of that boom and realize that if he didn't diversify the practice away from schools, the firm would eventually run out of work. So he let his partners, Guy Wobata and George Kassebaum, get and design the schools. And he, he focused his attention on finding that next building type, you know, university work. Uh, airports, hospitals, uh, housing, uh, anything he could find that would diversify that practice. Why? Well, diversity is strength. If you, if you know how to design anything or everything, you'll never be out of a job. And also, his principle to diverse, diversify the firm didn't just stop with building types. It started with geography, too. So the firm was started in St. Louis, but, but uh, after the firm was about 10 years old, or old, he opened a second branch in a uh, first branch office in San Francisco where I was sent. I'm a lucky guy. I was sent from St. Louis to San Francisco and I've been here ever since. And uh, because um, HOK was driven to become uh, a, a global firm, 
Also, then we started building offices uh, offshore. Now you can think about this, Enoch, and, and people listening. Maybe uh, this was true in, in how much that the big firms could do this, but now the world's getting smaller. And with the internet and social media, you can actually find clients around the world and work with them electronically. So set your horizons big and develop a strategy to attract clients wherever they are. And finally, diversify your practice by service type, not just architecture, but interiors, planning, landscape architecture, engineering, consulting, and so on. Why? Well, because those repeat clients don't always need architecture. Maybe they need some interiors work. Maybe they need a, a master plan for a piece of property. Maybe they just need a little consulting help and so on. So make yourself useful to those clients by being as diverse as you can. And in the case of HOK, which of course is a very large firm, didn't start out large, started out small, just like any other firm, uh, but became very large because each one of these diversification parts, architecture, planning, and so on, became an area of specialty in the firm. So people became specialists in landscape architecture, interior design, healthcare, uh, airport design, and so on. And then finally, uh, principle four in Helmuth's uh, four principles was to have leaders that are diversified uh, and specialized in their own area. His idea was that if you have people that focus in an area, they, as he put it, if you work on something every day, you get pretty good at it. And, uh, and also, and he, thinking again of his father and his uncle having disputes about who got to do what, if you have leaders that are focused in leading certain areas of the practice, they avoid that avoids power struggles, which is too common in many of our firms. So just to summarize it, talented people, supported by full-time work marketing and diversified uh, to the maximum extent possible, uh, led by specialized leaders is a foundation for long-term resiliency. Now you might say, well, gosh, there's a recession on or times are tough. How do I do, do all this during a recession? Helmuth actually started uh, this work during the Great Depression and figured out how to build this one piece at a time. If you, no matter when you start, you have to have some goals in mind. So these are pretty good principles to be following. In fact, they're, they're not only pretty good, they're excellent. And um, he had one other strategy, which isn't one of his four principles, but it became very important later on, which is a strategy to keep the ownership of the firm intact as, as the founders got older and finally retired so that the ownership transitioned to a younger generation of leaders. And most firms that I know don't do this. Most firms that I know uh, are led by one or two people. And when they reach retirement age, usually the business is not prepared to transition to younger leaders so they go out of business. And uh, uh, if you want to keep your firm sustainable, you, you, you should do something like what Helmuth did which is look for those young people, nurture them, give them an opportunity to buy into the firm as they grow. And that takes money, uh, that takes a lot of money. So you have to be a profitable firm in order to have a reasonable leadership transition and retained earn profits by out retiring leaders. What do I mean by retained earnings, retained profits? If you make a dollar or a million dollars in a year, Please don't distribute it all to yourselves as, as a bonus or as, your, as the, the payout for this year. Keep some of it in the firm's uh, bank account. That's a retained profit. You'll have to pay some taxes on it. But if you build up that cash account, you'll find that it gives you lots of flexibility in the future. You also need to have metrics for a successful practice. This is just a highlight. If you, if you develop simple metrics for your practice, and I know architects don't like to think about cash and finance and, and, and uh, accounting. So I've simplified this in three areas, spending, workload, and cash flow. 
50% rule is the, the biggest cost of any firm is the people. So if you limit the salaries, not talking about salaries and, and uh, fringe benefits, just the salaries. If, you, if your total salaries are uh, $1,000, then your firm uh, should be earning $2,000 in annual fees. If your salaries are, are $100,000, your firm ought to be earning at least $200,000 per year. Uh, and how's the other 50%? Well, if we had another hour, I could tell you how the other 50% gets spent. But just uh, many firms make this mistake that they get overburdened with payroll and they find that they've run out of money. Workload, 10 month rule. A healthy backlog for any firm is to have a backlog that equals 10 months of work. So if, you're, if your firm is earning, let's say $1,000 a month, you need at least $10,000 of backlog uh, in order to keep the firm sustainable. The idea is that in that 10 months, you also, of course, need to replace that backlog with new work. Now, I don't care if it's a thousand a month or a million a month. If, you, if you're earning a million dollars a month, you need 10 million a backlog and so on. The numbers, the numbers don't, uh, the numbers don't, the ratio doesn't vary no matter what your fee level is. You just have to keep that in mind. And finally, cash flow. Many firms run into cash problems, again, because, well, I've got money from this client and I, I have cash in the bank, so I have enough to pay my, my people to work on the next project. Well, you have to be careful that if you haven't been paid after 90 days, three months, that's a long time, then you should really, to be uh, honest with yourself, you should unearn that fee that you earned and say, well, I haven't been paid, so uh, I have to unearn it. I can't count it as earned unless I collect it later. That doesn't mean you should stop and, and give up collecting it. You just shouldn't, shouldn't fool yourself on your books. So let's go on. Supporting great design. I said, if your firm is not doing great design uh, or stand out or very, very good design, uh, you're not going to go anyplace. That's what people hire architects for. What is great design and how do you get there? Well, uh, I think it has to do with the effort you put into to design. And uh, this is the McLamey curve. It's been so called by that by other people, not by me. It measures as the effort the, the design firm takes over a period of the project. So if you look at a typical project, you have programming, design, design development, documentation, maybe bidding, and then construction. And uh, the traditional design effort looks like this. It looks like a, there's a big hump of effort, a major effort during documentation. This is based on really an old school, uh, that is that we were doing working drawings and we had to have lots of help to do the working drawings. These days with computers uh, and BIM modeling, um, my suggestion is that if, you, if you're really clever about this, you won't have that big hump there. But let's. This is traditional. Now, what's wrong with it? Here's what's wrong with it. As you design, your ability to control the cost of the project starts out at a very high level and very quickly diminishes to a flat line. And the, the cost of making a change starts out pretty easy, pretty flat. I can make a change in the programming and design phase almost effortlessly with a, just by putting another piece of paper over my design and sketching another design out. As you document more and as more decisions get made, obviously the cost of making a change for you as a design firm becomes greater. And if you find that you have to make design changes during construction, when the, when the contractor has to make the best change orders, then you're gonna pay dearly. Then it's a really steep curve. So that circle where those two lines cross, I call that the point of no return. And if you haven't solved the design problem, and organize your building so that it can be uh, adequately uh, understood and built by a contractor by that point, you will the project will fail and you will have another phase at the end, which we call the litigation phase. And that's when the architect and the contractor uh, are taken out of the picture and it's lawyers and insurance companies and judges. And that's a very expensive way to practice architecture. So what do we do? My suggestion is, my admonition to you young architects, 
forget about traditional design. There are many, many wonderful BIM tools out there now. If you take the time to learn how to use uh, the, the new BIM tools that are out there, and especially the analysis tools that come with the big BIM programs or that operate with them, things that will allow you to stay on program, to maintain your cost, to, to be green and even deep green, and, uh, and so on. You will find that if you put more effort in the design phase, the computer can be your aid and your guide, and you can actually flatten out your effort curve during what the what we used to traditionally call documentation and get ahead, solve the building early and get ahead of that point of no return that I've talked about. And if you do that, that effort is shifted forward in time and the litigation phase is eliminated because you have a successful project. That's the key to it. If you're a designer, work to develop a strategy to give you more time as a designer and less time as a documentarian and as a coordinator of the, the work. It can be done, I've done it. And then finally, a strategy for excellence. If you have all those other things, things to avoid, if you've avoided all those things, if, you, if you've got a firm that has a healthy backlog and you're supporting great design, what else do you need? I suggest there are th four things. The first one is you need to have united leadership. You and your partners need to have one mind about the direction your firm is taking. You need to have closure on what goals you want. Do you want to grow your firm? Do you want to expand? Do you want to give opportunity to young people? Do you want to be a firm where honesty prevails? <clears throat> you also want to support great design in everything you do. Uh, that has, that has everything to do with the decisions you make as leaders. How are we going to support great design this day, this year, this project? How are we going to give that support so that actually our design gets better and better and we build a reputation that sustains us? And how can we have a common shared culture that is, uh, that is positive and nurturing instead of destructive? Uh, Helmuth had this idea, he said, you know, about culture. He said, the firm should be inside like a, like a family where everybody helps each other to succeed. And he said, if the culture is collaborative on the inside, it will help you better compete on the outside. I think that's a beautiful statement and something that everybody should think about. The culture of the firm has to do with how people feel when they get to work there. Do they feel part of a, of a great firm where everyone is, is helping everyone else to succeed. If not, you have work to do. And finally, any, any, any excellent firm has to have dreams. What do we dream about doing as, in our future? Not just surviving and getting through this project or surviving this year and having enough to pay ourselves a so little money, but where are we going? What are we going to do? How are we going to make our firm better? How are we going to help the communities in which we work? Uh, become better? How will we help our clients become better? Uh, so if you have all of these things, then you have a firm that is going to sustain itself and be a better and better place for people to be. I wrote a book about this, designing a world-class architecture firm, the people, stories, and strategies behind HOK. If you wish to buy the book, uh, and you, you want to buy it from Wiley, you can get a discount by entering the code. And if you don't want to buy the book, that's okay. I'm not here to sell books. You can also listen to a 14-episode podcast series based on the book at gablemedia.com forward slash building build smart. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to 
smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.